Good morning, friends. Pastor Siri here with our sermon time, kicking it off in our sixth week in our Salt House Core Practices series. Love is a verb. Man, I'm coming at you, not live, but yes, via video, uh, as I continue to heal from post-concussion syndrome, and my body is still learning to be okay with public speaking and all that goes with it, so I'm just doing little, little things to move forward with that. And I actually had a setback, some of you know, about three weeks ago, I sustained another mild concussion while playing with our son. I know, right? And so it's, which was, it's been pretty wildly disappointing and sad and frustrating and challenging, but I'm managing the fresh symptoms that I have. I'm back in some physical and occupational therapy to deal with that. So just thank you for the continuing grace to be in process with you. So thank you for that. So my friends, What's your story, right? So we began worship today by asking that question of each other, and I wonder what came up for you in response. So this happens to be my favorite question to ask people when I'm just like, just getting to know them. It kind of disarms people, I find. It surprises them at the same time because it isn't that usual, so what do you do question, right? And the very question itself, it seems kind of impossible to answer that in the moment. Oh, my story right now, which it's just fun to watch folks kind of process that in real time. But I love this question really because it eventually clicks folks into remembering that our lives do have a narrative arc, a story that this moment, this season that we're living in is part of something larger, something that has shape and progression and movement with blissful highs and traumatic lows. And no, it's not a linear story, right? It doesn't follow a predictable path, but it's a story. It's our story. All of it part of who we are. And it's such a treat when we get to step back and notice where our story has been and where it's headed, and even how we would speak of it to someone else, right? So thank you even for a brief moment of that and being present to that question today. So this is part of why our core practice, that stories matter, has emerged here at Salt House. We want to be people who know and own our stories, who own our just our messy lives and continue to listen and learn from them. But it isn't just about our own stories, is it? We want to hear the stories of others too, right? So when we take time to hear other stories, uh, that's how we have these magical moments of synchronicity. The, oh my goodness, me too. I, I had no idea that was you also, right? Those kinds of moments. And also the, wow, that is so different from my experience. Those kinds of moments that teach us more about the diversity of human experience. So hearing stories the lives of others. It teaches us greater empathy and understanding. It can melt away a bias and judgment and even our prejudices. prejudices. So instead of telling a story in our heads about who someone is, we actually get to hear the story from them. So stories matter. That's our core practice. Stories matter because of our own stories, because of the stories of others, and also, you guessed it, because of the Jesus story. When you stop to think about it, it's a peculiar thing that we come back here every week, that we open up an ancient book, and and really, this book, it's a library, it's a collection of books. So we read these old, old stories. Some of them have been around for more than 3,000 years. And what we keep coming back to is this 2,000-year-old dude named Jesus, which is just weird, right? Why do we do this? Because stories matter. Because this is the story of God, a story of meaning and existence, of past, present, and future, a story with endless layers for us to peel back to discover not only greater meaning for what the story meant then, but to discover new and deeper resonance with our own stories and the stories of our modern world we're living in now. And also, this Jesus story is quite unpredictable. It is still alive and changing, and so we get to see how this ancient story is our story now, too. It continues to unfold in our lives. It's a holy, peculiar, radical practice for us to keep coming back to the Jesus story as central to our lives. But wow, I've never ceased to be amazed by what we find in this story together. We find ourselves... Stories matter. 
and we put this into practice here at Salt House in a lot of different ways. It's part of why we do our welcome question at the beginning of worship every week. It's why we take moments like what already happened today in worship, where we present our middle schoolers with Bibles and we say, we want you to know your story and God's story. It's why we have groups and places where we can study, where we can get to know and be known by others. It's why we eat together around tables where our stories can mingle together. And it's why we do what we call salt house stories. And it's a regular practice for us and it's something that we will practice today, now. So we do this, our salt house stories. We take our most central time together on Sunday morning, right? And we open it up to someone from our community, one of our own, as a practice of being people for whom stories matter. So someone gets to share their story, and we listen, listening for how their story resonates with our own story, paying attention to what is stirred up in us about what we're living in right now, and we listen also for the connections and resonance of the Jesus story present in their story. Almost like there's a Where's Waldo phenomenon, right? We're like, oh, there it is, aha, I knew the Jesus story was in there too. So my friends... Our Salt House story for today, we have the great privilege to welcome to the Salt House microphone the woman, the myth, the legend, Rachel Horton. So Rachel is our Salt House Kids Director, overseeing our programs with children and families. So especially ages 0 through 18, but in some ways beyond that, she also launched a mom's small group this fall. So two things that I love about how Rachel does ministry here. So two things. First, that she innovates. Rachel takes some of the best resources out there and then creates her own curriculum and projects and activities that use inclusive language that are rooted in research and best practices. And she does this while also, the second thing that I love, listening tenderly to who each of our kids is, finding a way for them to feel connected and to participate in ways that are comfortable for them. And if that's not love as a verb, right? I don't know what it is. And Rachel is just great. She loves board games, video games, and she's just such a delight to have on our staff. So I'm so excited for us to hear some of the complexities and gifts and detours that Rachel has faced in her story. So friends, give a warm Salt House welcome to our own Rachel Horton and her Salt House story. (laughs) Good morning. Can everybody hear me? (laughs) Um, all right. Uh, I feel like my story starts with Romans 12, 6, which reads, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. This verse uh, always resonated with me because I could look around me and see those gifts at work even as a kid. Uh, I had friends who were physically gifted and great at sports, some who were socially gifted and could make friends just anywhere, (laughs) which is not my gift. (laughs) Uh, Some who were musically and artistically gifted and some who were academically gifted and good at school. And that was me, I was was good at school, I loved learning. School was where I was comfortable, uh, where I excelled. And uh, starting in middle school, I actually spent my summers volunteering with my neighbor at a school. Uh, She was a special education teacher and we worked in a summer program with kids with moderate to severe disabilities. Um, And this actually lit a fire in me to work with kids with special needs. And I I didn't fully understand it at the time. I was 12, but it was there. Uh, I got straight A's through high school. I was active in in leadership of about seven clubs a year. One of those clubs was academic team where I met my husband, Anson. He was a senior, I was a freshman, so cute. (laughs) Um, I graduated high school as valedictorian. I loved school so much. Uh, That's just, that's what I chose as my career. So I went to school to be a teacher. Um, I loved working with kids, sharing knowledge, helping others to learn. This is where 
at that time I felt I fit in the world and it's where I could use my gifts. So I went to college and I got a degree in elementary education. And immediately after that, I started my master's, uh, a master's program for special education. But when I finished that program, I decided to take a year off. And I'm not normally a person who likes to take breaks, but I had to admit that um, I needed it. Uh, because you see, I had developed a facial tick at that point, and I, I had no idea why. And I just, in general, wasn't feeling well. Uh, maybe it was because I spent the last quarter taking classes, student teaching, and writing my master's thesis. <laughs> Probably part of that. Uh, looking back, that was insane, but at the time, it didn't register as odd or overkill or anything like that. It's just what I needed to do to be able to be who I wanted to be. Uh, so after a year at home, I still felt this apprehension about going back to work. Um, I, didn't, uh, I didn't understand why. I loved the work, I loved the kids, but something was wrong. So I talked to Anson about it, and of course he said he would support me, whatever I was going to do. And after a lot of thought and reflection, I decided to apply to work on my PhD instead of going to teach in a classroom. Uh, the classroom was where I had developed a facial tic and I wasn't feeling well, but I had no apprehension about going back to school because that is what I was good at and I was comfortable there. Uh, so I was accepted into the PhD program at University of Washington and I actually had a job as a mentor to a group of master's students and going into the grad school program wasn't the path that I had thought I was going to be taking with my life, but it was still heading towards the same goal. Uh, and we all know that joke about how to make God laugh, you know, you make a plan. <laughs> uh, and I, you know, told myself, if God has a different plan for me, a different way to get there, I'm cool with that, that's great. Um, I genuinely had no idea uh, what God planned for me, looking back on that. Um, a couple of weeks before the start of the PhD program, I started to feel anxious, and I put that in quotes for a reason. I'll explain later, I promise. Um, as the start date got closer, I stopped being able to eat. I would make food, I would put it in my mouth, but I literally could not swallow. So I stopped trying. Uh, I wasn't really feeling hungry anyway. I felt anxious, and that's totally normal when you're starting something new, right? Um, I was also struggling to sleep, but again, when you're starting something new, totally normal to be anxious. So then came the big day. It was my first day on campus. Um, took the bus into the city, went to class. Uh, if you saw me on that day or met me for the first time that day, you'd think I was totally fine. I was smiling and excited, completed all the activities, took copious notes. That means I'm okay, right? <laughs> um, I didn't feel right. But if something were wrong, somebody would notice. I was, I was convinced somebody would have noticed. So I got on the bus on the way home, and that feeling that I'd been having for weeks was just getting worse. Um, it was like I had been teetering on the edge of something for weeks, and on that day, I just fell. So on the way home, on the bus, I got this sinking feeling in my stomach and it felt like I had just been told someone had died. Uh, but no one had. I started to look around trying to figure out what was wrong, um, and then I realized I couldn't feel my arms anymore. Uh, I was just losing complete feeling my limbs, and when I got home I called Anson and I just said, something is wrong. I couldn't explain it, I had no clue what was happening, but something was wrong. So Anson came home and he took me to the emergency room. Uh, by the time they checked me in, my entire body was shaking in fear. Uh, they had to give me a shot so that I could stop shaking and could calm down enough to talk. Uh, they had multiple doctors and counselors and specialists come and talk to me, trying to figure out if I had been attacked or what had happened. And I had to tell them nothing happened. I went to school. like. I have no idea. Um, they offered to check me into the hospital at that point, but I wanted to go home, and they let me go home, and at that point, that's kind of when I had to start a totally new journey in my life. Uh, I went home, 
But the feeling of dread, that horrible feeling, just never left. Um, I started seeing a doctor, taking medication, receiving counseling. And at that time, I was diagnosed with uh, panic disorder and depression. And I had a lot of work to do. Uh, my time after the visit to the hospital was really rough. Uh, I did not feel human. I couldn't do anything because I had this constant feeling of immense fear and panic that something was wrong. And if you've ever had a panic attack, you probably know how that felt. This was like a panic attack and it lasted weeks. So, for example, when the doctor asked me if I was suicidal, I would say no, but then I'd also say, but if I didn't wake up tomorrow, I'm okay with that because it hurts so much to exist right now. Um, I think the best way to describe what I was going through is by telling you what I couldn't do. I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't go on the computer or answer the phone, any noise would trigger a flight or fight response. Um, that includes a knock at the door or just the sound of the trash can closing after someone threw something away. I had to immediately leave the PhD program. Um, in fact, I, I had to immediately leave everything because getting out of the house was a monumental challenge and I only attempted it when going to the doctor. So remember when I put anxiety in quotes, um, it's because I learned that that feeling that I had called anxiety my whole life was not what other people were feeling when they said they were experiencing anxiety. Um, when I was young, I would have a meltdown about certain things or avoid certain situations, and I thought that was just because I was a nervous person. My family would describe me as a worry wart. <laughs> and I know now, though, what I was feeling was not normal or a reasonable amount of fear or anxiety, and honestly, I had no way of knowing that growing up. And at this point, I want to bring you back to Romans 12. So I had these gifts. God had given me these gifts, and I had a purpose and a vision, and at that moment, it was all gone. I mean, I could do nothing. Like, what was happening? What am I doing here? Is, is this my life now? How do I live this life? And just what is this? So that state of panic, with help from many doctors, professionals, and family, started to subside after about a month. I had started at step one, the very basics, eating and sleeping. I had to relearn how to eat, how to sleep. Um, after getting those under control, we started working on little things. I would have one goal a day. It might be do a load of laundry. It might be try calling your sister for a few minutes and chatting. Uh, eventually, I was able to watch TV shows, and I mostly watched cake decorating shows on Food Network. Thank God Anson loves those too. <laughs> um, I started to be able to check my email and answer the phone, and after about six months, on a good day, I could do three things that day, and that included getting out of the house, which was exciting. <laughs> uh, things like grocery shopping or going to lunch with someone. Um, eventually, I would say it's about five years after the initial diagnosis, the doctors determined that panic disorder was not quite right. Um, I actually have OCD, which is obsessive compulsive disorder, um, but my compulsions are so subtle though, it's hard to see. Um, if the fact that it took professionals a year to, to figure it out is a, any indication of how subtle it is, um, I'm not surprised nobody noticed before. Uh, but it was great to be able to read about OCD and feel understood. This was me, and this described me, and I could name it, and I could understand it, and I could work with it. So things were returning to normal in so many ways, and yet also they weren't. <laughs> what was I going to do if I wasn't teaching? Who would I be? Um, I spent a bunch of time talking about this with my counselor and with Anson, and we agreed that I could try teaching special education again eventually if that's what I wanted. But because of the high emotional impact 
of jobs in special education, it's likely that I could have another fall like the one that had just happened. And I, I honestly, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Um, I just couldn't go through that again. So there had to be something else I could do. So why not try something completely new? Uh, with Anson's advice, I went back to school for computer science. <laughs> Uh, this was much harder for me. It was not as intuitive as teaching for me, uh, but it was fun. And in fact, by the time I graduated, I had done a senior project that was creating games to help teach kids code, and I was running kids coding camps. I hadn't changed that much, honestly. <laughs> so when I finished my degree, I started applying for jobs. Um, I went through two job offers, and both times it was an awful experience, not because the jobs weren't good, they were, and not because I didn't want to work, I really did, uh, but any time I got close to accepting a job, that feeling in the pit of my stomach returned, and I started to feel like I was going to fall, and I just kind of walked away from it. Um, and this was a little terrifying, because I couldn't figure out what I was supposed to do. Uh, I felt like I should be doing something, but any time I got close, I would have this horrible physical response. And so there I was, um, lost, confused, sad, depressed, tired. Uh, and then one Sunday at Salt House, Pastor Sarah mentions that they're looking for a new person to run the Children, Youth, and Families programming. And my eyes lit up and I was thinking, oh, that would be fun. And the crazy thing was, it wasn't followed by that drop in the pit of my stomach. And there were no nerves. It was just kind of, oh, that would be fun. And I started thinking of some fun things I could do. So I decided to sit on it for a week. I was sure the anxiety was coming. I was just waiting for it. But um, it didn't come. So I talked to my counselor about it. And she was, thought it was a wonderful idea and that I should go for it. And I talked to Anson. And he agreed. And then I had coffee with Pastor Sarah to talk about it. And she agreed. And I was having only good feelings, which is wild. <laughs> Um, so I applied, and it was still only good feelings, and I interviewed, and it was still only good feelings, and then I got the job. Still only good feelings. It just felt right. Um, and I thought about my gifts, those passions God had instilled in me, and this job lets me use them. So I genuinely feel this is where I'm supposed to be, and this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Walking this faith journey with the children and youth at Salt House. Because I can see God in all of them, and I know that there will be times when they are going to struggle. And I can understand that struggle, and I can walk that with them. And I can have compassion for them for when they feel lost or abandoned in their faith. And I can journey with them through the darkness and back into the light. I am a better person I'm better prepared to be there for them because of what I have been through, not in spite of it. I am proud of where I am, of what I have done, and where I ended up. I'm happy, and I love the work I do. And I thank you, all of you, for loving and accepting me as God made me, for trusting me with this ministry, and for walking this with me. So thank you, thank you, thank you. So friends, would you stand as you're able? So I invite you to hold out your hands in front of you like this. Palms up, and let's take a moment to breathe together and do two things with our hands open like this. First, we pray for Rachel, and then second, in response to what Rachel has shared with us today, to ask God to meet us here in our own stories. Let us pray. Creator God, in this moment now, we hold Rachel's story and her vulnerability with us with deep gratitude. Thank you for her story. Her life lived up with you. Her life and love lived here with us at Salt House, especially with our kids. She is a gift to our community for whom we say thank you and give a, the universe a big old high five that she is here with us. Continue to be on this journey with Rachel and Anson and Waffles into the next season of their lives. So in response to Rachel's story, let us ourselves be in touch with our own story 
We open up to hear what you are saying to us through Rachel's story. Perhaps recognizing that Rachel is our, in our own ways, like Rachel, we may have arrived somewhere that we didn't quite expect. But more than anything, we stand here now offering our lives, our stories once again to you. Opening to hear and see that you are at work. You are moving. You are here in our story as it unfolds. And so with this posture of opening and offering and listening, we sing this prayer together as our response. It's our movement into the next week. God, take us as we are, embracing us and loving us and moving us into what is next. That in it, we may be salt and life and love as a verb in the world. We sing and we pray.